ex-presentation by uh, Victoria St. John's on audit compliance not secure. So uh, we would like to thank all of our gold level sponsors, St. Mary University, USA, Trend Micro, Digital Defense, SANS, and our silver level sponsors, National Security Agency, Exabeam, Essential Federal Services, Open Security, Titanium Level, CyberSec Jobs, Denim Group, LMO ISA, Landmark Solutions. And uh, so the presentation will be uh, done by Ms. Victoria St. John. So please give a big round of applause to her. Thank you. Hello. So I can actually talk much louder, but I'm going to try and keep the microphone and keep my voice down. Um, so the whole point of this talk, if I go into the next one, there we go. So who am I? I'm an undergrad student at University of Texas at San Antonio. I'm in the master's program for information systems, uh, concentration in cybersecurity. I am part of the red team-esque group that hangs out there, but like we've now changed our team to red team hackers, so a bunch of memers. Um, one of the things for a recent job that I got is to when I was applying, they said, what would be the best thing to do on your very first day? I said, throw me into an emergency before the mundane. I said, literally, if you could say what could be the absolute worst thing that could happen, put me there because I don't want to do just basic training stuff because I don't actually learn anything from that. Um, the source material for this is actually a 10 page paper that I wrote for my cyber law class. I have it on my LinkedIn if you want to actually read through that. And I'm very thankful for my mentor, Elle, who actually combed through that and gave me an outline for going through this. So I tried to keep this at a minimum uh, when talking about the other companies. Specifically with Target, it was about poor network design. So they were certified in September of 2013. They were breached in December of 2013, literally within a couple months. The problem is with the company that had certified them, it was also additionally like another 15 to 20 companies that were immediately breached after they were certified. It was with how they were incentivizing to certify quickly and readily. It wasn't necessarily being aware of the setup and what could be the most secure environment for people. It was, hey, you get 15 ex 1,500 extra dollars if you can do this in two weeks. Um, they had 24-7 security monitoring team that was sending out alerts regularly, letting them know about stuff and they were just kind of ignoring them. They said, oh, well, misconfigurations happen, and a lot of security teams are aware of this, and they usually will say, that happens too. They had a $1.6 million malware detection tool from FireEye that they installed for the amount of money that they put into this. There should be no reason for the problem, but at the time, they were updating their point of sale system, so that's when security things can happen and go awry. The Verizon report that was actually on this said there were no controls limiting their access from any system, including devices within the stores, such as point of sale registers. Uh, one of the more shocking things was you could be in the deli section and on the register back there access the core of the network. They had a complete flat topography for the network and the number of times I've talked to um, Consultants, one of the things they bring up is if you want to protect your network, you need to be able to segment it, have subnets, understand what's happening on the network, be able to say, without a doubt, I have this many devices, I know these certain ones belong to this certain department, and try to implement those controls. The other one that I thought about was OPM. I was trying desperately to find any kind of company that stood out, was monumental and huge, uh, November 2013 is when the activity began. April 2015, they still saw suspicious activity after they thought that they had thwarted and pulled them out of the system. Uh, people within the company knew that they were deficient for regulatory standards. They knew regularly every time when it came up, and when they tried to check again in 2017 to say, hey, what have you done to actually improve for compliance? You're asking for $11 million. What can happen? Uh, they didn't have a really good plan of attack. They had started implementing things, but the encryption wasn't across the entire network. It was in bits and pieces on some traffic, and ultimately for the budget approval, they said, no, we need to know more about this and what's going on. So ultimately, the stipulation for being able to give this talk was that I provide solutions and not just hark on problems. 
I have the great blessing of being part of a company into it, and I got to talk to their compliance and regulatory team, and they said, one of the best things that you can do is actually get down to the heart of what it is. I put my own definition, and I was like, oh, it's passing a regulatory audit. Somebody comes in, and they say, yep, you're good, and that's it. That's the end. That's why everybody checks all the lists, and they go, this is how we're going to make the company better and secure. And they said, actually, the point of doing these is to demonstrate your security posture to your customers. So for smaller companies, medium business size, as well as even your large companies, if you were to say, instead of going, we have to pass this compliance this quarter, how much can we throw at the budget, what does it need to do, and immediately the next day ignoring it, undoing all of it, you can look at it as a selling point to customers. And when you're trying to do security within your own company, let's say you are one of the engineers and you're trying to make it better, and you go, I hate compliance, I don't want to do any of this, it's extra paperwork that I have to do. Think about it that you are cementing your job and saying, I provide value to the customer. So officially the enforcement comes from FTC and it's under section five of the Federal Trade Commission Act. And they are the ones who swoop in and say, we know that you're not doing the things that you need to do and it's all very vague kind of guidelines about what it is. Oop, I went one too many. There we go. So I think of this meme a lot whenever I think of compliance. Is It's really a guideline. They don't give you anything specific. It's very niche in regards to what it is. If you're doing PCI, which is payment credit card information, it's all in regards to that information, how it's encrypted, how it's stored, where it's moving. It doesn't say anything about the rest of your network. It presumes that you're smart enough to put two and two together to do that. But if you do HIPAA, it's all related to health information. So encrypting that, watching where that goes, who has access to it. And when it comes to trying to extend that and offering more, then I decided to go over to a PCI document one of the compliance guys actually gave me, and I just started crossing out cardholder data and went for the main hit points. I was like, so what's the most important things that you can do to your network to actually help to make everything better and like go beyond compliance? Compliance is just checking off the box. So build and maintain a secure network and systems. Install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. Cross out cardholder. Do you actually have a firewall configured throughout your network for everything? From there, do not use vendor supply defaults. I have a friend who recently got a new job and he's telling me the lovely horror stories associated with the defaults everywhere. Admin, admin for everything. The firewalls, the routers, the security cameras, the printers. And he was like, I keep creating accounts and I don't know where they're going. I can't see them. He thought there was another layer above. There wasn't, that's it. That there was like no level of security at all. And as soon as he brought up the idea of encryption and keys and having second factor authentication, managements, I never thought of that. So if you've been around people who don't understand anything related to security, but they know compliance and they're like, we have to check the boxes, we have to make sure we're not being fined, try and bring up more about the security posture. Are we trying to add more value to the customer, but also to our business. Because businesses, people process technology, so people are people, people will always make mistakes. Process is what is integral to how the company goes, how it functions, and a lot of companies will say that it's the information itself that is integral to keeping the business up. So like if you were to DDoS the network or something and they don't have access to that information anymore, is it about the information or is it about the software that they use to do that? If you were to just suddenly throttle the entire network accidentally, unplug a cable or something, can they still conduct business? Uh, think like a hospital. So if they have records everywhere of their patients and they need access to know that medication so they don't overdose them on something. What if all of that suddenly is encrypted? Do they have backups? Do they have the paper charts? They have paper charts everywhere. It may not be the most accurate, but they have some kind of thing in place. And it may not necessarily be because they're trying to be within compliance, because a lot of them, if they have uh, Medicaid, Medicare accepted, they have to switch to the new updated 
um, online for holding things, but like protect stored data. So whatever you have there, are you protecting it? Are you trying to encrypt it? If you're a small business and you happen to work within anything like health information or financial information, or maybe you're in the HR department or you know the HR department doesn't do anything, they literally just scan the document and put it there on their computer. It's on a shared local. Anybody can look at it. Are there any controls in place that like an engineer cannot go look at that? One of the things that was disturbing and alarming was I worked at a place and the engineers, the lowest level engineers, could look at the contracts that dictated how much was put towards a project, how much each tester was supposed to be paid, and how long it was supposed to last. That wasn't supposed to happen because they immediately knew this is just a three-day project. I don't have to work hard. There were people who fell asleep and watched YouTube at their desk, and I was super offended. Um, additionally, encrypt transmission. So it's a double-edged sword to try and do that because I was talking to the compliance people, and they said when you start containerizing on your network, it's great because if anybody gets into that box, they're literally just inside a container. They can't really do anything else. Maybe if they manage to break out of that, cool. They're only within that subnet, and you don't have enough access to do anything anyway, so what does it even matter? Versus a flat topography of a network, if they just get in, there's no containers, there's no nothing, there's barely permission restrictions on stuff. They can start installing, uninstalling, getting through whatever kind of trouble and mischief that they want to do. Um, but with the containers, as a compliance thing, it makes it difficult to see in, and then you have to work with your cloud provider to actually see that that's happening, which can be a problem, but it's well worth it to help in security and controlling what's happening. Um, authenticating access, physical access, these, these should be basic things that immediately come up, but there's a number of people who will say, well, it's okay, I have a drawer in my office, I don't have the key, but that's where all the documentation is. We don't have anything supported up online, and that's all the documentation to prove that everybody can have access to the system. Nobody else knows where it is, and I don't have the key to it either. So make sure if you do have these controls in place that there's more to be able to like have a literal, it's an operations perspective, so if you do encrypt things, make sure you can unencrypt them. If you have a key to hold the documents, make sure it actually works. If anybody is in charge of one certain aspect of documentation, make sure there's another one in case they go missing. I went to a tabletop exercise where they said we had one senior system engineer and like it seemed like a red herring that they were talking about people that had gone to countries where, oh, their computer might be compromised. It was a red herring, because ultimately it was the one system admin that hadn't been there for two months. And that was the only one that had the access to everything. Uh, monitor things. Uh, it's a great thing. So if you're within networking, you actually know where the bodies are on the network. You know who's doing what. And you have the ability to say you shouldn't be doing that. If you are in systems, you should be able to set those controls in place and be able to say, no, you can't do that. It's, you can have the policy back it up, but also have those physical controls in place and regularly test security systems. So one of the other things is people will get these wonderful, magnificent systems in place and say, we have a firewall, we have malware detection, we paid a lot of money for it. Have you ever tested it? Do you know if it works? Is it correctly configured? For the number of times that people have ignored SOC calls coming in, alerts, hey, this is bad stuff. Are you paying attention to it? No, it's probably misconfigured. We don't need to pay attention to it. And then, obviously, maintain policy. There's nobody likes dealing with policy. Nobody wants to approve it. Users don't want to add more passwords, no more characters or anything. Like, I'm up to 16, 18 characters or something when going through passwords, and I hate it. But I know it's necessary for the sake of the company. And uh, people expect you to have a password manager at this point, a vault of some kind. Because if you're doing it in a notebook, the physical security of where you are, if you leave that notebook there, it doesn't have a lock. It's just sitting on your desk. Maybe you're in systems and you have 10 or 15 passwords that you've written down inside that notebook. And you just leave it there. You go out for lunch for an hour, you come back. Everybody in your team's trustworthy. They're not going to go through it. What about anybody else? 
can you trust everybody else in the building to not go through your stuff? I can barely trust them to not take my peanut butter. I paid $6 for that thing of peanut butter. I'm like, I'm be super salty if they take it and trash it. Um, ultimately, one of the best phrases that I heard from the compliance guys is it's about the intention, not the definition of the law. Because most people look at compliance and they say, okay, to the T, follow it, make sure. Did we encrypt everything? Is it on there? Did we do it right? Did we go this way? Did we do everything that we absolutely can possibly do? And that's not what it's about. Because like, so imagine you're a small business owner and you work in a restaurant. You're trying to worry about your overhead. Are you getting the freshest supplies possible? How much customers? Are you worrying about the marketing? Are you bringing all of that information in? You find out, well, I accept card data, so I have to be PCI compliant. What does that even mean? You start click going through all the stuff and you pull up PCI DSS and you're like, okay, this is the stuff I gotta do. Am I doing it all right? But you're not thinking, this is about the security of everything. You're just thinking, this is what I gotta do to make ends meet and continue going on. It's about the intention, not just that definition. The basic definition is like, make sure you're getting things taken care of that need to be taken care of. Ultimately, it is about everywhere, all passwords, all monitoring. Do you do background checks on your employees? What kind of background check do you do? Do you just sit there and say, do they have a felony? Cool, good enough for me. There have been numerous issues with several businesses in paying no attention to things. So like with Facebook, it was plain text passwords that came out. There were other encryption things that had come up. Same with Snapchat. It's happened to Twitter. And a lot of these companies, they start out and it's small and it's a little baby. They care about it and they're like, yay, it's getting bigger and we don't really have to do anything else. You have to do the shots, vaccines, everything like going up. The baby's getting bigger. You have to buy the baby clothes. You have to make sure the baby continues doing everything because it will be a full-fledged business and enterprise that has to have everything taken care of. And if you still have like maybe one of the first vaccines, you, so you have McAfee installed on the computers, but that's it. Is the baby still going to have the same immune system as an adult? Is the baby going to be able to handle if it's put in a kindergarten classroom with 20 other kids that may or may not? sick that stuck their fingers you don't know where right so I that I like to think of it as it's a baby for a business that they care about it they don't want you to ruin the baby when you want to go in and do a security penetration testing they're like no don't poke the baby it's my baby I care about it I've taken care of it it's gotten to where it is and I'm comfortable enough to have somebody look at the baby and say the baby is okay it is compliant with what it needs to be but don't do anything else to the baby and like uh, as somebody who wants to do penetration testing, find out what all is wrong. Imagine that you're approaching someone's baby and asking, can I poke the baby? That, that's what happens when we go in. And I care about compliance and regulation, but I also want to be able to do more. Ultimately, I'm sorry that there were not that many memes. <laughs> My boyfriend offered to put a China slide in, but I didn't. Do y'all have any questions? What's up? So it seems like most of what you run into is industry is looking more at flash than that. Yes. They are willing to throw as much money as possible at it, but they're not actually looking to solve the problem. They're like, if we solve the problem at the basic, it says it's doing the thing, but they're not doing more of, did we verify that it's set up correctly? We paid God knows how much for Cisco to come in and set up everything. Did they remove the defaults? Did they tell us how to actually maintain it? Did they tell us what to do with it? No, but we paid a lot of money and they said they configured it right. That having been said, uh, you said you've gone inside the law of this executive order that came out earlier this year regarding management now being on the block. They get a breach, C level managers wind up losing their head. Is that accurate or is it yet again more flash in the I don't know. I haven't looked into the law. What's up? Could you repeat the question? Oh, me. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so he's asking recent executive order that came out that C head managers are also on the chopping block if there is a breach. I personally don't have any information about that and know about it right now. 
it feels like it's trying to because one of the things that I've wanted to ask in interviews with companies is if I'm if I'm the engineer that screwed up I'm the one responsible for the security breach I did not encrypt the things am I the one that's fired are you going to train me what's gonna happen I'm responsible for the 20 million dollar breach what are you going to do are you going to fire me is it the networking department is it all of systems is it just me does everybody hate me now do I get any kind of training and there's no easy answer nobody wants to say that that's the really rough stuff because they're not quite sure what to do how big is the regulatory fine and one of the great questions that a friend of mine told me is if and when meeting other industry professionals that are older ask them what's your one big oops what's the thing that you did because at some point someone somewhere will have definitely made multi-million dollar or thousands of dollar worth of damage it's encrypted it's gone oops we reset the server nothing's there or anything and everything in between if you get the chance to talk to them ask them what that big oops is and find out how their management dealt with it if they kept them if the manager was gone like there was reference for uh, Experian people were like saying oh it's a music person music people don't know anything my undergrad was in music and if you put a liberal arts person with a bunch of people that aren't going to talk the liberal arts person is going to be loud and talk so yes it's easier to blame the loud person in the room but people really want to blame somebody at the end of the day yes they want to point and go that person did it it's their fault that doesn't necessarily fix it anything else what's up I'm sorry I do not I'm sorry and uh, like you can find my paper on LinkedIn as well if you actually want to go through that and like saying they had flat topography it's all their fault and blah 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 I don't want to stand up here and hash that and blame that because reality is you want solutions you want to be able to fix it you want to apply more but the reality is if you blow up the network on your first day or week of work there's a larger problem to begin with yes they absolutely it's the double-edged sword of everything I think of it as like a little throwing star there's a lot of edges everywhere and you grab it you're gonna get hurt but sometimes a decision has to be made what's up so uh where do you see us as a country in 10 years where we define things as being in scope and compliance versus further regulated by the government? Um, examples would be like GDPR, and uh, CCA, how it came to So the stuff with California that's going on right now is we're in a very shifty economy for trust. Companies don't know who to trust. Customers don't know who to trust and uh, even at RSA it was a huge thing that they brought up because even if we try to implement a way for um, allowing that trust a system even if it's customer based if it's business based who's going to be able to ultimately provide that trust and I don't have a solid answer for it but I know it, it will be difficult and it's gonna be a lot of fighting back and forth as to is it gonna be the industry is it gonna be the government is it gonna be the consumer that's dictating that trust and what laws ultimately get implemented how much can actually be trust because I mean everything is gonna be gone yeah so thank you Victoria for your presentation thank you all for attending this one <laughs>